going to unravel the layers of faith woven throughout history. More and more we hear crimes against women that have to do with Islam. For example, in Norway, Sweden and Denmark, the number one crime is rape. Muslim men raping European women. Why is this? Why are we seeing more and more women wearing burqas? We're going to be examining the history behind Islam and women in this program. It'll be fascinating. You won't want to miss it. Our question of the day, which will be answered at the end of today's program, is who were some women who influenced American history? More and more, we're seeing crimes against women in areas where there's a larger Islamic immigration. Why is this? Well, if we go back, we can see that there is a particular view of women that goes all the way back to Muhammad. Muhammad was married to Khadija, his first wife, when she was 45 years old and he was just 25. But when she died around 620 AD, Muhammad then married many more wives. There are reports that it was anywhere from 11 to 15, maybe 20, because he got a fifth of the women taken in battle. Now, it's interesting, one of his wives was named Aisha. And Aisha was six years old when he married her. Aisha had her father, Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr is important in Islam because he was the founder of the Sunnis. And that is the way 90% of Muslims today are Sunni Muslims. And their first caliph was Abu Bakr, the father of Aisha. Now in the Hadith, we have Aisha's own words. And she says this, the prophet engaged me when I was six years old. And she went on to say that uh, my mother came out when I was on the swing set playing with some friends. And she called me and I went with her, not knowing, uh, she was not knowing where she was gonna go next. And then the mother took her and washed her and several of the Muslim women wished her well. And then it goes on to say, then she gave me to them and they prepared me for the marriage. Unexpectedly, Allah's apostle came to me in the afternoon and my mother handed me over to him. And at that time, I was a girl of nine years of age. Sahih al-Bukhari, which was one of the hadiths. So she was engaged to Muhammad at six years old and they consummated it when she was nine. Now, Muhammad had a dream, and in the Hadith al-Bukhari and in the Hadith Muslim, uh, it says how that Muhammad uh, used to say to Aisha when she was a child, I have seen you twice in my dreams as someone who was covered with a white dress made out of silver. And I heard a voice saying to me, this is your wife. When I removed the silver cover, I found you. Then the voice of revelation said to me, this is your wife. So I said, this is the will of Allah, let it happen. So Muhammad married Aisha again when she was six and consummated it when she was nine. And Aisha was Muhammad's favorite wife. Uh, he did have many more. And one of his uh, servants said in Hadith al-Bukhari that the prophet used to visit all his wives in an hour round during the day and at night, and there were 11 in number. I asked Anas, had the prophet strength for this? Anas replied, we used to say that the prophet was given the strength of 30 men. And so Muhammad had a, a, a room for each different wife, and every night he would spend it with one of those wives. Now, a problem happened when he had another slave woman named Mary. She was a Coptic Christian taken in battle, and she was Muhammad's favorite wife for pleasure. And she was not a fully a wife yet, she was just a slave, but Muhammad would spend time with her, and one time he was caught in the bedroom of another wife with Mary, and there began a big stir in the harem. And so Muhammad had a verse revealed to him from Allah, Surah 3330, O consorts of the Prophet, 
if any of you were guilty of evident unseemly conduct, the punishment would be double for her, for this is easy for Allah. And so we see that after this, the wives would no longer grumble or complain because they would get double punishment. And now, for those that are familiar with the, the God of the Old and New Testament, we can see that, that Allah is not the same God, and there's quite a difference in the morals and the values there. Uh, in the Hadith, Muhammad said, women can be married for religion, for fortune, or for her beauty. So marry one for religion. Uh, there are the names of his wives. Here is the, the list of the names. Sadwa Aisha, which was his favorite wife, Uma Salama, Hasfa, whose father was Caliph Umar, who was the, the second uh, caliph, Zanadab, uh, Jawari, Um Habib, uh, Safiya, and she was married to Kiana, who was the Jewish chief of Kaibar. And Muhammad had Kiana stretched out and tortured and then beheaded. And then Muhammad took Safiya, uh, his wife, as Muhammad's wife. And so uh, there was Mayama, uh, Fatima, uh, Herod, Asma, uh, Zanadab, another Zanadab. There were three Zanadabs. Halba, Aisha, Maria, that was Mary. And then um, uh, Um Saban, Mayana. Uh, you can see that there's quite a list. Now... Muhammad, uh, in the Quran, lays out some distinctions. And the distinctions were that uh, it took two women to testify in court against one man. And that a woman got half the inheritance that a man gets. In Islam, they have a thing called blood money. And blood money is the retribution paid to a family on the death of a family member. And so, when somebody is murdered, and so the blood money for a woman is half of the blood money for a man. Blood money for an infidel is half of the blood money for a male Muslim. And so if you are a Christian or a Jewish woman, you are literally worth a half of a half. You're worth half because you're an infidel and you're worth half again because you're a woman. And so we see that equality was not something that came from this belief system. Now, Muhammad had an adopted son named Zaid, and Zaid was married to Muhammad's cousin, Zanadab. One day, uh, Muhammad went to visit Zaid, and Zaid was not there, but Zanadab was. And she was dressed scantily, so Muhammad desired her. And it got so out of hand that finally, Zaid had to divorce Zanadab so Muhammad could marry her. Now, this was still abhorrent in Arab culture for a man to have relations with the same woman that the son had relations with. But Muhammad had a verse revealed to him from Allah giving him permission. And it's Surah 3337. It says, Fear Allah. Then when Zaid had dissolved his marriage with Zanadab, we joined her to thee. Now, it's interesting. In the Quran, whenever Allah speaks, it's always in the plural. So we joined her to thee in marriage in order that there may be no difficulty to believers in the matter of marriage of the wives of their adopted sons. Now this verse actually ended adoption in Islam. So there is no adoption. So if you have an adopted son and you have his wife that you want to marry, that would be wrong. But since there is no adoption, he's just like any other man and then it's okay to have the wife of any other man. Um, now. Uh, when this happened, Aisha, which was his favorite wife, she said this. It says, then when the Quranic verse that allows Muhammad to postpone his, the turn in bed with any of his wives was revealed, and when Muhammad said that Allah had allowed him to marry his adopted son's wife, Aisha, one of his wives, told him, O oh, Allah's apostle, I do not see but that your Lord hurries in pleasing you. Now, we are going over this because we want to see the attitude that Islam has toward women because more and more Muslims are moving into Western countries, moving into Europe, moving into America, and we're seeing more and more that there are rapes and crimes committed against European women. And we're wondering, why is this? 
As a matter of fact, one of the rising crimes in Holland is what's called a smiley. That's where they take a knife and they cut a woman from her mouth to her ear. And they do this because she's not wearing the burqa, the veil. And they feel like they want to send a message that all women are supposed to submit and wear the veil. In Syria, there's an increase of crimes where Muslim men throw acid in the face of women who are not wearing the burqa. So there's this pressure more and more for these non-Muslim women to submit to this Islamic um, practice of wearing burqas. Now, we can go on and look at some of the other references in the uh, Quran to women. So here is uh, the Quran, Surah 2, 282. It says, And let two men from among you bear witness to all such documents. But if two men are not available, there should be one man and two women to bear witness, so that if one of the women forgets anything, the other may remind her. So this established that a woman's testimony is half of that of a man. And uh, in the Hadith, it says that the prophet said, isn't the witness of a woman equal to half of that of a man? The woman said, yes. He said, this is because of the deficiency of the woman's mind. Now, I know women that have gone to Yale and Harvard, and believe me, there is no deficiency in the mind of a woman. Um, then you see in um, the Quran, Surah 411, it says, the share of the male shall be twice that of a female. And uh, so it goes on to talk about a Muslim man can take four wives. This is Surah 4, 3. It says, marry women of your own choice, two, three, or four. Now, Muhammad also said that you can have as many women as you can take in battle. So uh, they would have their jihad, and they could kill the man and take the women. And it says you can have as many women as your right hand possesses. Now, again, we're examining this because we're wondering what is the attitude in Islam toward women? Well, it goes all the way back to the beginning. And one of the verses, Surah 434, says, if a wife does not obey the husband, the, the husband can beat her. And so this set a precedent where in Germany, uh, a Muslim man was beating his wife and she went to the judge. And the judge said, you're a Muslim, it's okay for you to be beaten. And there was international pressure which forced the judge to change. But we're seeing that in uh, Arabia, a woman was gang raped and she was whipped 90 times because she was gang raped. In other words, in Islam, if a, a woman is raped, she's guilty for having tempted the man. That's why women wear burqas. You see, in Jewish law, if a man rapes a woman, he has to marry her. In Islamic law, if a man rapes a woman, she gets whipped a hundred times because she was used as a tool of Satan to tempt him. So this is very important that we understand the differences in beliefs because the, the traditional Christian idea is let's go ahead and say all beliefs are of equal value and let's let's value everybody well it is true that we value every person and that every person is equal in the eyes of God but not every idea is equal and some ideas come from God and they're in the Word of God and some ideas don't some ideas come from the devil and so it's important for us to understand that we have to identify the source of these ideas. Now, in the Bible, the uh, Apostle Paul wrote that in Christ there is neither male nor female, bond or slave, there's Jew or Gentile, but all are one in Christ. And we see in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, where Jesus even repeated it, that a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one, that the two are equal. In Genesis, it says that God created man in his image, 
male and female. So both the male and the female are in God's image. Now, I don't understand how all that works, but I do know that it set the precedent in Jewish and Christian thought that both men and women are equal before God, that they're both made in the image of God, therefore they're equal before God. This is unique. It is not in existence in other countries, in other cultures. William Carey was a missionary who went over to India. And he was a strong Christian. He helped translate the Bible into their native language. And William Carey ended the Hindu practice of sati. Sati was where if a Hindu man died, the widow, if she was a pure Hindu, she was expected to throw herself on the funeral pyre and be cremated along with her husband. Uh, but William Carey, the Christian missionary, preached against, the, against this and stopped it. So we can see that the Judeo-Christian view adds a higher value to women than many other beliefs in the world. Most of world's history, power was in the hands of kings and pharaohs and sultans. America did something unique with power in the hands of the people. But are we moving back in the direction of a king? Well, in the book, Change to Chains, we see the 6,000-year quest for control and where we fit in the picture, a fascinating book that you will want to get. To receive your copy of Change to Chains, send your love gift of $25 or more to the address on the screen. I'm sure you recognize the picture on this book. This is the Mayflower. This is the cover of a book by Marshall Foster, The American Covenant. The Mayflower was the boat that the pilgrims took across the Atlantic Ocean to found the colony in Plymouth, Massachusetts. The year was 1620. Well, William Bradford was the governor of the Plymouth colony, and he later wrote a book of the history of the Plymouth Plantation. And in there, he writes that in the year 1625, five years after they were there, that they sent two ships back to England, one filled with dried fish and the other with 800 pounds of beaver skins. They were going to trade these to get supplies for the colony. But this is what William Bradford wrote. He says, so they went joyfully across the ocean together. And they had such fine weather that he never cast off the, the smaller boat till they were well within the English Channel, almost in sight of Plymouth, England. But even then, she was unhappily taken by a Turkish man of war and, the, and carried off to Salar, which was Morocco, where the captain and the crew were made slaves. So here we see that one of the pilgrim ships in 1625 was headed back to England and it was captured by a Turkish man of war. Now the Turks in the year 1625 captured over a thousand Englishmen from England and the islands and the, the fishing villages and took them to Morocco where the Sultan was Moulay Ismail. And Moulay Ismail had over 25,000 mostly European slaves built him a huge palace called the nickname the Versailles of Morocco. But Moulay Ismail also had 1,042 children because he had nearly 500 wives. And so we see that having many wives in Islam was a standard idea. Matter of fact, many sultans had over 1,000 wives. One sultan reportedly had over 12,000 wives. And so this is different than the Judeo-Christian faith. This is something that where the, the Bible says that a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one. In Islam, Muhammad permitted four wives, plus as many as you could take in battle, plus many of the sultans had innumerable wives. And this is an important point to bring out because it contributes to the way that in the Islamic world, women are viewed, that women are not equal as in the Western civilization. Uh, and so here we are in our West, in America, and we have to ask ourselves, is there something special about our country? Is there 
uh, anything that we want to preserve about it. Well, when you come down to it, yes, there is something special. And one of those special things is equality. Now, it took a while to develop, but you read the writings of America's founders, and they kept going back to the Bible. And they kept going back to these Judeo-Christian ideas that you're equal before the law because you're equal before God. And that those freedoms went out to women as well as men. And so we've accomplished something in America that is a good thing of equality of men and women. Yet we're beginning to see a reversal. And as Islam expands, we see that inequality is now being reinstituted. So this is an important thing because the gospel is meant to, to give freedom and liberty. And we see that freedom and liberty beginning to disappear. Uh, it's interesting, the words freedom and liberty have an opposite. And the opposite of that is submission, forced submission. And the word Islam means submission. So in other words, it is in a sense the opposite of liberty. Now, are there nice Muslims? Yes, they're very nice Muslims. And they're genuinely nice, but they serve a purpose in the spread of Islam. That as nice Muslims move into a community, what happens is, is the country, the community begins to say they're nice, let's let, let more of them in. And when more of them come in, they get involved in politics. And then they begin to want to pass laws to promote Islam. And amongst those laws are the Sharia laws, which require women to wear burqas, which require uh, that a woman be beaten if she's raped, and also even honor killings. And honor killings is where a father will kill his own daughter if she dishonors the family by dating or becoming friends with a non-Muslim. And so we see that this country that's given birth to freedom and equality is beginning to introduce something that is at odds with freedom and equality. And we should learn the history so we can make better decisions for today. Our answer to today's question is, who were some women who influenced American history? Betsy Ross is credited with sewing the American flag. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the abolitionist novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Sojourner Truth preached against slavery. Harriet Tubman led the Underground Railroad. Julia Ward Howe wrote Battle Hymn of the Republic. Susanna Dickinson survived the Alamo. Anna Jarvis lobbied to create Mother's Day, as did Sonora Louise Smart Dodd, Father's Day. Susan B. Anthony crusaded for a women's right to vote. In 1838, John Quincy Adams told Congress, quote, history has innumerable examples of women who not only took an active part in politics of their times, but who are held up with honor to posterity for doing so. Our Savior himself, while on earth, performed that most stupendous miracle of raising of Lazarus from the dead at the petition of a woman." Unquote. We've been having a fascinating study of Islam and women. Uh, here's a book called Inside Jihad, written by Dr. Tafiq Hamid. And he reports about the Sydney gang rapes. This was in 2006, where four women were brutally raped by a group of Muslim men. And when this became the news, the Muslim sheik said that it was the woman's fault. And he describes how if you set some raw meat out, you can't be surprised if an animal comes and grabs it. So the women were guilty for dressing provocatively. So in Islam, it's not the man's job to control his impulses. It's the woman's job not to tempt the man. A very different view than traditional Judeo-Christian beliefs. We're seeing more and more of this. Matter of fact, there's a woman named Ayan Hirshi Allen, uh, Ali, and she is from Somalia, but she went to Holland. Uh, the Dutch uh, had her elected even to their government. And in 2004, um, Ayan Hirshi Ali had a documentary film done with a filmmaker named Theo Van Gogh. 
And Theo Van Gogh uh, did this documentary on the way women are treated in Muslim uh, world. And unfortunately, he was murdered, and a note was stabbed into his chest that they were going to kill Ayn Hirsi Ali next. And so she fled, but she documents and writes about this treatment. And uh, here's a couple interesting verses. This is in Sahih al Bukhari, and it says Muhammad allowed women to be taken in battle to be raped, even instructing the men not to interrupt it. Uh, as they were in the habit of doing. You see, they could sell the women for more in the market if they were not pregnant, but they would rape them and then try to stop short of getting them pregnant. And when they went to Muhammad, Muhammad said, don't stop, because if Allah wills for somebody to come into the world, he must come into the world. So in other words, if you're going to rape these women, you have to rape them all the way. This is quite a different teaching than we would hear in the Old or New Testament. And then here is a verse. This is Surah 424. It says, All married women are forbidden unto you, except those captives whom your right hand possesses. So Muhammad permitted four wives, but you could have as many wives as you could take in battle. So this was one of the motivations to get involved in jihad, because you could come away with some extra women, and this was approved of by the founder of the faith, Muhammad. I hope you've had some eye-opening information during this program. And it's important to understand that the Judeo-Christian belief back in the book of Genesis said that God made man in his likeness, male and female. That man and was made in God's image, male and female, that they are both equal before God. Now again, I don't understand what God's image looks like, but I know that we're made in his image, both male and female. And this is something unique, and it gives value to the woman, that the woman has equal value before God than the, as the man does, which is not the way that Islam presents it. So thank you for joining me today and in learning this profound information. This has been a TCT Network exclusive production. If you would like to see more exclusive special programs, send your support to TCT, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959.